The date is uh, 27 November. November. Walter? Well, I met the, uh, the, the President, Lyndon Johnson, right after he had come to Washington, when I, uh, uh, in the Senate that is, when he went, came in as a senator for the first time, 1948, and I'd just gotten back from overseas after the war. Uh, I stayed and covered the Nuremberg war crimes trials and then was in Moscow for a couple of years and finally was assigned by the United Press to Austin, uh, not to Austin, to Washington uh, as I came back here in late uh, 48. Uh, and uh, a dear friend of mine was D.B. Hardiman, uh, who was then doing Sam Rayburn's uh, uh, biography or autobiography, I guess, uh, and was a, he'd been the editor of the Daily Texan uh, when I was on the Texan. He was a fraternity brother at Chi Phi and a dear friend. So, uh, of course, I looked him up right away and uh, almost the first person he introduced me to, he, he wanted me to meet, of course, Sam, Sam Rayburn, which was a great privilege, and then the uh, new senator from Texas, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who uh, both of these were very impressive figures in quite a different way. Uh, Rayburn, uh, in first, on first meeting, was a rather quiet man. Uh, he didn't always remain so when things got tight in the House of Representatives, where he was an extraordinary spokesman, of course, uh, leader. But, uh, but Johnson was rather boisterous on first meeting, at least the day I met him. I learned uh, that uh, this was undoubtedly because uh, he felt things had gone well that day uh, on the floor of the Senate. Uh, we, we met in his office where D.B. took me and uh, and he was uh, buoyant, uh, and uh, when buoyant, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson uh, was also a little noisy. <laughs> he uh, uh, he was a booming voice that day, and uh, and uh, full of political stories. Uh, he felt he'd accomplished one, and I don't even remember, unfortunately, what the uh, event was. But it was something that he'd been working on, apparently, and, and felt he had succeeded. And in, he felt that his success was because of his superior political skills in working his fellow senators. And I'm sure that was the case, because that, uh, that was uh, a noteworthy part of the, uh, of the Johnson persona. Uh, that first of all, working his fellow politicians to his will, and second of all, enjoying the victory when he had it. Uh, if he didn't win the victory, he was a vastly different figure. Uh, he was uh, he was uh, almost as uh, as uh, raucous in defeat as he was in victory, but in much a different way. Uh, there was. Uh, quite a lot of uh, profanity used, indeed, as he described why he lost, uh, whether he blamed it on himself or others. It didn't matter. He, uh, he, he was very quick to explain, uh, and sometimes with uh, some pretty good political lessons in, included in his uh, analysis of why he had lost. And of course, he was certainly, as so frequently described, uh, bigger than life. There was no question about that. And of course, I learned to know him a lot better as uh, our our careers paralleled in some in a form. I uh, I hardly became president of the United States, but I was followed able to follow him through his career and cover most of it as a, the anchor man of CBS News and uh, in our political coverage. Uh, I loved politics and I liked politicians. I found them all interesting for the most part, whether I agreed with them or not. And most, mostly I seemed to disagree with them, regardless of what party they were. In that, in that regard, I was an independent. I was an independent, not liking, <laughs> not liking what was going on, usually uh, in the halls of Congress or in the administration offices. But anyway, uh, uh, Johnson, uh, of course, he did, he did not take kindly always to our reporting. Uh, and when he didn't, uh, he, was, uh, he let me know about it almost instantly. And when I was on the air in the evening news, I was, I, I was originating out of uh, New York most of the time, and he would call up in the middle of the broadcast. 
uh, not always, uh, he wouldn't be on the phone, but somebody from, the, from his office, from the Oval Office, would be on the phone. And uh, I never took their calls. I couldn't take them. I was on the air, I was broadcasting. But my secretary would take the call, and she'd come out as we went to a commercial or something of the kind, and, and she'd say, the White House is on the phone, naming the individual. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and she would report, he said that some of them at the White House felt that our report was not exactly uh, accurate. Some of them at the White House, of course, was obviously none other than Lyndon Baines Johnson. When some of them spoke, why all of them responded and uh, did whatever they felt was necessary. And then from the White House, uh, from the Oval Office, I'm sure Johnson was listening in as they picked up the phone and called Cronkite. And I think he may have thought that they were talking to me when they were talking to the secretary. The secretary's report sounded like that might be the case. When we were together, there was a vastly different story, of course. Uh, then he would berate me in person if he felt that the reporting had not been to his liking and perhaps had been wrong in any way. And when, when Lyndon Baines Johnson wanted to make a point to you, uh, he was a strong man, a big man, and, and strong. And he literally would grab you by the like a coat lapels and pick you up by the lapels, even as later on he picked up that poor dog by the ears. He, he would have picked us up by the ears if he could have gotten a good hold, I'm sure. Instead it was the lapels and he'd pull your, your nose right next to his. And from that position, of great discomfort for the recipient, uh, you would learn precisely how Lyndon Bain Johnson felt about that particular issue. and even more importantly, how he felt about your reaction to it. I'm sure it must have happened to, to, uh, to fellow politicians, pro and con, uh, as it did to those of us in the press. And I can tell you when Lyndon Johnson's nose and my got, mine got nostril to nostril, that was a summit meeting. <laughs> we, uh, uh, but uh, there was a, quite a lot of that. I uh, had the great, great privilege of doing his, uh, his television biography. Uh, which we did for CBS. Uh, we shot it, shot it all. He re retired. He left the presidency. He was living back on the ranch, and we did it at the ranch uh, over a period of days, a period of weeks, actually. We'd go down for a few days at a time. And, and there, there was the opportunity, of course, to explore all of the questions that uh, he was willing to discuss, and that was most of them. He was very candid, uh, quite candid. Uh, and uh, uh, we went through the history of his administration. He was, uh, uh, he was very philosophical at that point. Uh, he could rise in the, at it on the occasion, occasion to, uh, to, to uh, rekindle a little of the feeling he might have had at the time of some political defeat or of some people who, uh, who deserted what he thought was the right cause and took the other side in one or another political campaigns. He, he would, in, in, on occasion, grow a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, feisty about it. But most of it was quite philosophical and, and very well done. Uh, we did have one little uh, typical Johnson episode, really, quite typical. Uh, he, Lyndon Bain Johnson did not necessarily believe that the rules that governed others applied to him. Uh, he, he had his own version of, uh, of uh, how he and the law, he and the rules, he and the, and the, and the procedures in Congress should be conducted. Uh, they were quite different in his case than with others. And uh, in one uh, situation during our, our interview, the long interviews, in his career, uh, we got into the assassination of President Kennedy. And I asked him, I said, uh, as we were getting deeper and deeper into the matter, I said, do you think that there was any international conspiracy involved? And he, he thought about it for a moment and, and uh, pondered and said, well, yeah, yes, I, I had a feeling there might be, might be something there. And then and then I couldn't get much more out of him. He, he, he shut up about it. Well, we had a system of doing those presidential memoirs that was, had worked very satisfactorily. Quite clearly, there's a problem in doing an interview with an immediate past president. 
who is loaded with an awful lot of secrets, who, uh, he, uh, which he himself may not quite recognize for their sensitivity at that point. And uh, so we had a, a deal whereby we did a audio tape of the interview, and the president, or former president, uh, had, uh, had uh, several days, I think we had three or four days, uh, that he could review the audio tape and without any other questions being asked, if he said something had to come out, it came out automatically. There was no, no we, we did not question it. This was to safeguard the secrets that, of course, he harbored in the, the very active brain. Uh, in this case, uh, we were doing the editing and finishing up the editing almost as oh, almost a month later, that uh, his office called and said, uh, the president uh, says you've got to eliminate that part about where he mentioned the possibility of the international conspiracy in the death of President Kennedy. Well, our reaction to that, first of all, the, the producer who took that came to me right away. Together we went to the head of CBS News. What do we do? It's a month later. We're almost finished with the editing at this point. We'd have got to reopen all the editing uh, to get that business out and fill the, fill the spot. And furthermore, nobody else has asked for that. And there was an agreement. They had the tape, just like everybody else. Well, uh, they, we took it back to the top management at uh, CBS, Frank Stanton, the president, to advise his office that, uh, there was, that uh, they had we, their agreement, they would agreed with it, and they had not uh, pr protested for almost a month. Well, of course, the Johnson office exploded. Uh, the, he has asked for this, and he insists on it. Otherwise, this film will not be shown on the air. And uh, I must say that our front office uh, was stuck with that, and they said, that's all right. <laughs> In that case, it won't be shown on the air. Well, that wasn't what Johnson wanted, of course. He simply wanted that bit out, not that we should eliminate this biography that he, I think he was quite happy with. He'd seen some of the parts of it, or maybe all of it. I think it was after he'd seen it that he said it had to come out. Uh, maybe others saw it with him. I'm sure they did. They, they were the ones who said that shouldn't be in there, not, not the president. Well, we held off on this matter until uh, finally we did agree. Then it was taken off. But one of the kind of typical things in dealing with President Johnson uh, uh, in his retirement particularly. We, we did this filming at one of the guest houses on the ranch, the banks of the Perdinalis. And because of the strange kind of, uh, I guess, what you might call it, uh, Texas prairie color of the room, the, our producer said, there's only one color suit that's really going to look good in here. Wear a, wear a green suit when, I, when you come down for this first filming. I said, a green suit? I, I hope you're kidding. I don't have a green suit, and I don't know anybody who does have a green suit. He said, well, get a green suit. So I went to Brooks Brothers and got, believe it or not, they had some green suits. I got a couple of green suits and went down. Now we've filmed from time to time, one week and a couple of weeks go by. And film. So, so I left my two green suits in the guest room where we did our filming. Well, now we had an interesting situation. Well, this was while we were head to head on this question of whether we we're going to cut out this portion about the international conspiracy. And uh, uh, I, I was decided that, that we were all finished. I said, I want to send for those green suits. Well, they, somebody in our office had a better idea that said, you can't do that. If we send for the green suits, it's going to like, look like we've broken off negotiations. They said, on the other hand, if he should happen to send the suits to you, we're going to know they broke off the negotiations. So the, these green suits were hostage to Lyndon Johnson's uh, attitude about a, a small piece in his autobiography. And incidentally, that bit about the international conspiracy, he knew something that the public didn't know and did not know for a long time and still has not had the full picture on. And that is that there was a CIA, FBI plot to assassinate Castro. Uh, this, the FBI and, and uh, CIA never told the Warren Commission report that was looking into the, uh, the, the cause of the, the conspiracy, if there was one, or looking into the death of President Kennedy. 
They were never told that there had been such a plot. They did not learn it until long after they had done their official report. And this is what Johnson would have been revealing if he had said he thought there was an international possibility of international conspiracy was that he had knowledge uh, that, uh, that the rest of us did not have. So uh, there was a sensitivity there for him to want to defend. Well, that's right. enough for a uh, chapter. Let me ask you to go back. <laughs> uh, uh, Back in 1968, last year of the Johnson administration, there's the old uh, 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 much told story that uh, after your broadcast on Vietnam, mm -hmm. uh, the president said to George Christian, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost the country. Do you remember that incident? Oh, that? I remember very well. Uh, we had, uh, when the Tet Offensive uh, began, uh, I said I wanted to go out there and have a look for myself uh, on this uh, this terrible offensive and the losses we were taking. Uh, after all, we've been told barely a few days, it seemed, a little more than that perhaps, before the Tet Offensive was launched by the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong, uh, by Westmoreland and others that light, they could see light at the end of the tunnel, uh, the, the Vietnam equivalent, the boys would be out of the trenches by Christmas, that kind of thing. And uh, this, was the, uh, this was the official line out of Washington, the official line out of the White House. Although by that time we now know uh, and knew shortly thereafter that Lyndon Johnson was darn upset about the way the war had been conducted, upset about the reports he was getting from the Pentagon, upset about the fact that despite the, uh, their claims from the military people that we were winning the war, they kept asking for more people. He had to go to, off, go to Congress often, too often for more troops. Uh, and now with the Vietnam, with the Vietnam uh, the Viet, uh, the Tet Offensive over, he was being told by Westmoreland a few more troops, a few thousand more troops, and we can finish the job. Well, that, of course, uh, I guess he was hearing before we did our report. I went out to Vietnam, covered the closing couple of weeks of the, Viet, of the Tet Offensive, and uh, uh, came home, and uh, it, when I reported back to my, the authorities at CBS, uh, they, had, they said, you know, we think you ought to just tell the people what you've just told us, because I was telling them, I said, you know, we're not going to win that war. We, we ought to sue for peace and get out of there. We've done our best. We can. And they said, you should tell the people. Uh, we at CBS, and we were very proud of it, we felt that we had the, about the best reputation of any of the reporting teams, print or broadcast, uh, with the people of, of uh, seeing to be fair to both sides, the pro and the anti-Vietnam sides. Uh, and I think that was too true. We got so many letters of condemnation from both sides that we just weighed them. And as long as they weighed about the same, we, feel we, were, we felt we were in the middle of the road. If you're getting shot at from both sides of the road, you must be in the middle. And uh, we had that feeling. So I guess with a certain amount of uh, of uh, Hutzpah, we, uh, we went ahead and I did my documentary on the Tet Offensive, and then after a proper break with commercials and labeling what I was about to say as a personal editorial, personal commentary, I said that I felt we could not win the war and we should sue for peace and, uh, uh, and admit that we had done the best we could uh, in trying to preserve a land uh, where democracy might be created, uh, and we had, had failed. Well, uh, that, that was the piece that Johnson heard and watched, and uh, apparently he got up personally and snapped off the television set and said, well, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost America. Uh, well, I didn't know that for months afterwards. Nobody told me that for a long time. And uh, uh, I guess it was true. I'm not true that he lost America with that, but uh, true that he said it. It was one of the pieces that uh, that built up to his um, statement on March 31st that he would not run again. Um, I know that uh, we've got to get you back, and you've done mm -hmm. a, 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 a wonderfully well, but before you finish, Bob may have something to ask you. 
But uh, this isn't only about LBJ. Reflect a little bit on Lady Bird and how you feel about her and how you, your, your relationship with her. Well, I think one of the great strengths of Lyndon Baines Johnson was Lady Bird Johnson. Uh, I think she was a calming influence and also a very important uh, uh, sounding board. Uh, when when uh, I can imagine what the household must have been like <clears throat> with a man as driven, as filled with the events of the day, as filled with what he was going to do about them, uh, and coming home at night or going upstairs at night in the White House and trying these ideas, whether, in, whether he was intentionally trying them out or not, he, he knew that he'd get some response from Lady Bird. And, uh, and she was, uh, I think, uh, as I say, a calming influence on him considerably. I'll tell you a very personal story that I've never told before, uh, and I think perhaps it belongs in this series of memoirs. Uh, uh, Liz, uh, oh, what? <laughs> my Alzheimer's is working. Carpenter, Carpenter of course. <clears throat> the, uh, the the as we were preparing for the inaugural for for Johnson's retirement from the White House, uh, I was in Washington, of course, getting ready for the the inaugural, and uh, I called Liz Carpenter, uh, who was Lady Bird Johnson's press aide and was a major figure around the White House, uh, uh, for to have dinner. She had some time. And uh, she agreed. Well, the, the evening when I was supposed to pick her up, uh, just a few few nights, two or three nights before the inaugural, I was going to pick her up the White House, take her to dinner. And she called me and said, I'm sending a car for you. Don't send one for me. Well, I knew something was up. And indeed, a White House car picked me up and took me back to the White House. And we went into that little office off the Oval Office. And there was the president. And we sat there and we knocked back a little bourbon and we talked and we talked for, I don't know, two and a half or three hours. But in, during the course of this wonderful talk about his past and his, and his future, uh, and uh, it was a very philosophic, very quiet, uh, uh, sad talk, I think. He, uh, uh, losing power wasn't something that he looked forward to, of course. Uh, but somewhere after the first hour or so, the private phone from upstairs rings, and he said, yes, Bird, yes, Bird, yes. Oh, I know, well, I'm, I'm going to be up there in just a few minutes, just a few minutes, just a few minutes now. It's okay, Bird, I'll be up in a few minutes. Well, another half hour went by, <laughs> phone rings again. Yes, Bird, I know, but we're just finishing. Uh, it's rather important, but uh, uh, um, we're just finishing. Be up. Well, this went on, apparently with her getting more and more angry, and what it was was she was summoning him to dinner. Well, finally he said, "I've got Lady Bird, I've got uh, Liz and, and Walter Cronkite here. I'm going to bring them up for dinner." Well, we went up to dinner shortly thereafter, and Lady Bird was in her curlers and in a robe, and she was having none of this visitors for dinner after waiting two or three hours. The dinner was cold. She'd undoubtedly told the kitchen, "I don't." I don't want it kept warm. Let him eat it cold. Let him have it cold. And it was a, a very cool dinner. And I could see how her influence could be very important with the president. He, uh, he, he'd been pretty full of himself up to that time. And he cooled down completely. And uh, it was a very quiet, uh, I, I can say it certainly was a family dinner. It was cold, and, <laughs> and the hostess wasn't exactly adorned for a, a formal dinner. Uh, but it was a, a very exciting one for me that night. You, you became close to her and friendly with her uh, after the uh, administration, particularly in the summers. Didn't yes, indeed. I, I didn't uh, really uh, uh, know her that well during the administration. I met her several times, of course, in various circumstances, and in various uh, uh, various circumstances. And on one occasion, I had dinner when it was a little more formal upstairs, and very well, only two or three of us. Uh, one of his old colleagues from Texas. 
there had been a reception at the White House, public reception, and one of his old colleagues and sometimes enemy, political enemy from Texas was there. And I think really he wanted to show off for him more than anything. And he had invited him up to, for dinner upstairs and he invited me to come along. And uh, uh, so obviously I went along, it was a very nice occasion. But it was very interesting, a very interesting thing. As I say, I'm quite convinced that the president was really showing off, trying to show his power uh, to a defeated political uh, figure. Uh, and he started talking about the war in Vietnam, mostly about the war in Vietnam. But he started referring to, I'm going to send in my airplanes, and then I'm going to send my ships in there, and then I'm going to send my troops in. And the troop, my troops are going to do this, and my troops are the my airplanes. And it was really quite a quite a uh, 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 egotistical demonstration of presidential power that suddenly all of these military forces weren't those of the United States, but those of Lyndon Baines Johnson. And uh, I thought it I thought it was a revelation of a side of him I hadn't quite seen before. I might have suspected as such because that was his character, but, uh, but I hadn't heard it expressed in quite such uh, uh, certain detail. Walter, um, yeah. uh, I don't know if you've been briefed on George Christian. Pardon? I don't know if you've been briefed on George Christian's condition. No, I have not reached. But they've just taken him off life support. Beg your pardon? They've just taken him off life support. Oh, they have. Yeah, and I thought you, it, My you, you might want to reflect. He's a remarkable George. survivor, isn't he? Yes. It's would, incredible. Would you, like, would you like to reflect on George? And your, huh? Would you like to reflect on George and your relationship with him? Well, no, I don't really have a lot there. It, uh, you know, it, uh, he, was, uh, he was a spokesman who was uh, always available. And, and exceedingly helpful, George Christian was talking about. He was, he was always helpful to the press. He was always, of course, the president's, uh, the, the president's, uh, uh, he, he was presenting the president's side always. Uh, which sometimes are a little difficult. There were incidents where, of course, it was rather hard to justify and, and to clarify uh, uh, in, in the form that Johnson would, would appreciate. Uh, and uh, George walked that very thin line and did it magnificently. I always sort of saw him with an umbrella up over his head on the tight wire. <laughs> and he somehow this go, seemed to always manage to get to the other side. Since you have said that, and I, would you mind if we are asked, if we gave that section to uh, CBS, what you just said about George? No, no. Would that be all right? Yeah, give it to who? CBS? No, why, why would CBS want it? Well, he's going to die. And oh, gonna... oh, you mean it, though, yeah. sure. Well, of course, of course, okay. yeah, sure, Good. sure, it'll be fine. Right, All right. I know that you, you've got uh, 250 people coming in to see you. That, <laughs> but, uh, Walter, thank you very much. Listen, it's a pleasure to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> With his bad leg, i got to stand up around that well, party. Well, I really do appreciate right. it. Yeah.